We have traveled a long way since the beginning of this series. We followed the English Revolution through all the highways and byways, through all its uh, victories and defeats, triumphs and despairs. But now that we've reached the end of the road, it would seem that we have turned full circle and are back just where we started. A great people's revolution, which aroused such great hopes, ends up as the dictatorship of one man. And in many ways, it, it resembled the old dictatorial regime, monarchical regime of Charles I. Yes, but such comparisons are misleading. Despite all the external similarities, the new regime was very different to the old, and it had a very different class content. Now, if you look at history, you find that it very often happens that the goals, the aims that men and women uh, intend, very, very often turn out to be very different to what is actually achieved. And this is certainly the case, the case here. Oliver Cromwell believed uh, fervently, intensely, that he was, uh, he was creating the conditions, neither more nor less, than for the creation of God's kingdom upon earth. Yes, but the end results turned out to be something rather different, different altogether, in fact. In 1653, Cromwell became the supreme ruler of England with the title of Lord Protector. The new regime was to be known as the Commonwealth of England. And if one examines the, the pomp and circumstance surrounding the ceremony of his uh, recognition as, as the protector, well, you could only come to one conclusion, that this closely resembles a coronation of a king. In fact, the Victorian historian Richard Green I think he describes the scene where, where Cromwell was officially inaugurated as, as head, head of state, and he, he, he makes the, the following observation, which I quote. In the name of the commons, the speaker invested him with the mantle of state, placed the, scep the scepter in, in his hand, and girt the sword of justice by his side. Now here we have, of course, all the pomp and ceremony of a coronation, except for one thing the name of king is lacking. Yes, but in many ways you could say that the Commonwealth begins to represent uh, precisely that, a monarchy. And to all intents and purposes, yes, the Lord Protector was like a king. The revolution had abolished the House of Lords, uh, for example, it is an example of, a, of how Cromwell begins to push the clock back. It had abolished the House of, of Lords, yes, but Crom Cromwell creates a second chamber consisting of 70 members. The only difference, and it's a significant difference, is that it's no longer the aristocrats who are there by right of birth, but men named by the protector himself. Yes, but this is another example of the way in which the democratic gains of the revolution are being slowly but, but surely undermined. And yet, and yet, a fundamental change is taking place in England. Now, as Lord Protector, Cromwell held absolute power in his hands. That's, uh, you could say that. But in reality, the real power always lay with the army. It was in the hands of the army. This regime was ruled by the sword. Bonapartism, to use a, a word which has not yet been dreamt of, but nevertheless is applicable, is precisely it's ma many aspects to Bonapartism. But in essence, it always, it's always the same. It's ruled by the sword. And in the person of Oliver Cromwell, the lines between military and political roles have become so blurred as to become indistinguishable. Yes, but this army is no longer the same army that uh, existed before. This is no longer the army of the levelers. This army has been purged of the most revolutionary elements and is now merely more or less a passive tool in the hands of the leader of Oliver Cromwell. And in the last analysis, of course, power depended on the army or more correctly, let's be clear about it, not, not the army, not the soldiers, 
but the army commanders, the generals, the grandees, as they were known. And Cromwell, in order to stay in power, he had to keep the officers or the grandees contented. He did this in various ways. For example, he divided the whole kingdom of England into military districts, each of which is under the jurisdiction of one of these so-called major generals, as they were known. And these men possessed absolute power over the lives and property of their subjects in each region or, or county. They were, if you like, like little Cromwells, the same as the bureaucrats under Napoleon were little Napoleons, or the bureaucrats in Stalinist Russia were little Stalins. These were the little Cromwells who exercised their power in an arbitrary and despotic manner, like Cromwell himself. That earned them, of course, as you quite justifiably, the hatred and resentment of the population. And of course, they were above the law, and therefore they could do what they liked, and therefore, of course, they were quite corrupt. They enriched themselves, as many people in this new bourgeois republic, because that's what it was, were enrich enriching themselves. They were notoriously corrupt, and therefore, there was an outcry against the abuses that they. That they that they carried out, such that Cromwell eventually had to clip their wings and eventually had to withdraw their powers. In any case, I think that he was uncomfortable of having, of having any power alongside him which could possibly present some kind of a threat to his rule. So the army finds itself as the one power in the land. But again, it's not the same army, I repeat the same point. The dream of the revolutionary soldiers had turned sour, completely sour. Although the old ideas were still present, what was known as the good old cause, it was still present in the, in the minds of the ordinary soldiers. But these revolutionary soldiers, what they'd wanted to establish was a commonwealth of the saints on earth. That's what, the, that's what they, they, that was their declared aim. Instead of that, they succeeded in establishing only a bourgeois republic. They had wanted to establish a society in which everyone would be equal. Now, nobody was equal. On the contrary, the uh, class differences were even more, if that's possible, were even greater than what they were in the previous regime. On the one hand, a small minority of the population is obscenely rich. These are upstarts, merchants, crooks of all sorts, swindlers, speculators of all sorts. Officers in the army included, of course, were involved in this. And Cromwell himself, once he was relieved of warlike task, he, uh, he threw himself into the, uh, the, the task of the development of the economy and the improvement of the administration, which he succeeded in doing it. The whole administration was overturned. It was dragged, if you like, from feudalism, from the backward feudal regime, into, into the beginnings of the modern uh, epoch. For example, for the first time, Britain possesses a standing army. This is an innovation. It's a change, which allowed Britain to win many wars and uh, military victories, and naval victories in particular, over Holland, which in turn prepares the way for the British Empire. It prepares the way for the age when, when Britannia rules the waves, which it did in the following century. So this, again, is a, is a step in the direction of the, the development of capitalism from its embryonic stage to a fully developed uh, condition within the space of the next century. Yes, he, he, he passed all kinds of uh, laws. I think nearly a hundred ordinances, as they were called, were passed, dealing with such issues as finances, the imprisonment of debtors, roads, police, the conditions of prisons, even public amusements. We'll come to the question of public amusements in a moment. But although Cromwell was completely, I'm convinced of that, this is obviously the case, the man was completely uh, unconscious of the fact what he was doing in practice, was preparing the ground for the further development of capitalism in England, neither more nor less. And this, objectively speaking, uh, was the real content in the end, at the end of the day of the English Revolution. Given the material conditions at the time, no other outcome was possible. I mean, I know that's not uh, popular these days with our post-modernist friends, who, as you know, are not particularly flavor of the month with with myself, uh, who think that history is entirely arbitrary. Some of them have even had the stupidity to say that you could have had communism in England at the time, <laughs> despite the material conditions, which just frankly were not available. 
what you had, I think this causes a lot of confusion when dealing with the class nature of the English Revolution. I think it's wrong actually to speak of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in the modern sense. That's a, a rather out of place. What you can and should refer to is the embryonic proletariat and the embryonic bourgeoisie. That would certainly be accurate. And the, the embryonic bourgeoisie now begins to take wings, of course. But the nation is more divided than ever. You've still got a, a, a terrible economic crisis, partly caused by the war itself, the disruption of the war, disrupted trade and ruined many industries and so on. So a lot of people were struggling just to survive. And that's a factor. That's a powerful factor in the development of counter-revolution, which we'll deal with, uh, with later on. You have the obscene rich on the one uh, hand, more and more rich, more and more insolent in the, in the sense of superiority. At the other extreme, you get the very poor people, including the slaves, the poor slaves, you mustn't forget. Not blacks, by the way, in the main, in the main they were whites. They were, English, Scottish, and Irish in particular, they were slaves being worked to death in the sugar plantations of Barbados. That was the reality in the new bourgeois commonwealth. The new Jerusalem. Oh yes, don't forget, that's what people were looking for. And the religious radicals, don't forget them, the religious radicals were fighting for the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God on earth. Not a kingdom in the clouds, not after you're dead, but the kingdom in the here and now, based on justice and equality. And if we strip away all the external verbiage, the external uh, aspect of religious uh, of religion, what we are really dealing with here, and people don't understand this, what you're really dealing with, what the people were striving for, was a society based on justice, solidarity, and equality. You could say they were struggling for socialism or communism, and though those words were not generally known at the time, except to a very tiny minority, perhaps. But once, you see, once the, the, the revolutionary essence of the Christian message, message was removed, what are you left with? You're left with a dry husk that provided no nourishment either for the body or for the soul. And the further removed that the Commonwealth became from the, the communist ideas, I'll say that the communist ideas of the levelers in particular, the more fanatical became the religious, uh, the formal religious aspects of the Puritan preachers, who now were very much in the saddle. And these Puritans uh, interpreted the Bible not in a revolutionary sense, as had been the case up until now, but they considered it in a very narrow, unpleasant sense, actually. They, they give a bad a very bad name to Puritanism. It's, you know, this, this narrow-minded, sour, sour-faced uh, uh, killjoys, if you like. Yeah, well, there, there were such people, oh yes, and they were in a position of power, furthermore. People who, in, who considered any form of amusement as, 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 or simple enjoyments of life as a mortal sin. So the New Jerusalem, becomes turned into a ridiculous parody of itself, a, a caricature of itself, where men and women were su supposed to spend all their lives either working or reading the Bible. Oh yes, nothing else, nothing else. And this religious caricature was, was rigorously enforced by the force of law. The state in its wisdom decided to close the theaters to prohibit sports on Sundays, there was to be no more, uh, no more dancing around the Maypole at the, on May Day. Incidentally, it wasn't, wasn't just dancing that they got up to. They got up to other stuff, which was a little bit uh, different. I think now it would be uh, considered to be um, rather obscene, but we won't deal with that. Anyway, uh, no more dancing around the Maypole at Easter time. No more Morris dancing, which is a pagan thing, obviously. No more... Mince pies at Christmas, believe it or not, they, they prohibited the consumption of mince pies at Christmas. In fact, they prohibited Christmas itself. Christmas was made illegal, you couldn't celebrate Christmas or Easter or any of the other Christian festivals on the grounds that these were really pagan festivals. And by the way, that's a fact. <laughs> you can't fault them on that. They knew the Bible. They knew the Bible, they knew the scripture. All of the so-called festivals of the Christian church, as a matter of fact, have a pagan, a very clear pagan origin and content. There's no argument about it. 
it's true. But nevertheless, it's, 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 it's a fun thing, isn't it? It's, people enjoy themselves. People don't, in those days, they didn't have much opportunity to enjoy themselves. They had a few uh, amusements, all of which were now banned. No more horse races, no more bull baiting, if you know what that is. No more cockfighting, no more bear baiting. Now, you might say that um, it's a very good thing from the standpoint of the cocks and bulls and bears that these cruel sports were banned. <laughs> but Macaulay <laughs> uh, once said in the famous quote that um, the Puritans uh, prohibited bear baiting, not, beca not because it gave pain to the, pain to the bear, but because it gave pleasure to the spectators. And I think there might be some truth in that caustic uh, observation. No more of this, no more of that. In fact, no more of, no more of anything except playing and working. Now this fits very well, fits in very well with the Protestant work ethic, or even better with what Marx called, Karl Marx called, the primitive accumulation of capital. It fits in very well with that. If all that people are supposed to do is to work hard and read the Bible, that's fine from a bourgeois point of view. However, it did, did mean rather a miserable, uh, to a miserable state of affairs for the majority of the population who didn't like these reforms at all. Other reforms, of course, were more acceptable. There were important reforms of religion, for example. The church had been reformed. Church of England lost its monopoly, which was a good thing. And religious toleration was uh, extended to all uh, uh, sects or uh, religious tendencies, with two exceptions. Uh, even the Quakers, even the Quakers, by the way, whose radical views were generally regarded as blasphemous and scandalous by most Christians, they were protected. The only exceptions were the Roman Catholics, of course, and the Episcopalians, the church supported by Charles I, who Cromwell saw as politically subversive, as they probably were. Incidentally, Cromwell also, you've got to give the man his due, he also allowed the return of the Jews to England for the first time since... Uh, since the Middle Ages, since the reign of Edward I, Jews were allowed back, partly on the basis of toleration, you know, but, but also he had good uh, economic reasons for inviting the Jews back. Cromwell looked, looked at, uh, at Protestant Holland, at bourgeois Holland, and he saw that the presence of the Jews was very good for trade, so it was, and therefore the in interests of the merchants and of trade were served by this uh, with this development, as it was subsequently by naval, naval victories over Holland, as I previously said. So there were, there were undoubtedly uh, elements of progressive elements in the, in the new regime, no question about that. But, but not everyone was happy, but not at all, not at all. In fact, some people were distinctly unhappy. There was discontent. There was discontent both on the left and on the right with the new regime of the protectorate. The Lord protected himself. Cromwell lived in, in, in fear, permanent fear of assassination. Oh yes, and these fears were well founded. There were many plots against his life and many attempts at assassination. And the price of his staying alive and staying in power was eternal vigilance. With the result that he established, or rather his secretary, a man by the name of John Furlow, constructed a formidable apparatus of, of state repression, an army of spies. Here's another parallel with Napoleon and Stalin. I'll deal a little bit more with that question later on, but it, it, there are parallels. Yes, and Cromwell had spies everywhere, not just in England, but outside on the continent. He had an army of spies, actually, a very efficient army of spies, a bit like the KGB, I suppose. And he found ways and means, or thorough, thorough did, of infiltrating the royalist circles right to the highest level. Yes, he had his spies in the very uh, closest uh, elements to, to Charles II in, on the continent. Not a difficult task using copious amounts of gold, which they possessed, uh, to buy the services of, of people close to the king. Now the royalists, for example, pl plotted an insurrection. Well, they pl plotted many things, but they, there was one particular insurrection, a serious insurrection. Yes, but the, the, the hour of monarchical restoration had not yet struck at this time, and the conspiracy was, of course, found out by the spies, denounced, and the, uh, the leaders of the conspiracy were executed. 
The others were thrown into prison or sold as slaves and trans transported to Barbados. Not a very nice place to go. And Cromwell actually hit upon quite a, a novel idea, quite a, a clever idea to avoid assassination by the royalists. He let it be known through his agents. He let it be he informed the, 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 the Charles and Co. That if they made any serious attempt against his life, he had left instructions to his agents to exterminate the entire royal family, every single one of them. So there'd be nothing left. No heirs to the throne, no nothing. And that, I think, this somber warning had a very sobering effect, I think. And that's probably why they didn't uh, succeed in assassinating him. Yes, but it wasn't just a threat from the, the right, there was a threat from the left, perhaps an even bigger threat, from disenchanted and embittered revolutionaries, levelers, and ex-levelers, who saw in the elevation of Cromwell to Lord the Protector as an abomination and a betrayal of the principles for which the Civil War had been fought. And they didn't forgive this. Men like Harrison, Overton, Rich, Oakey, all of them acted as uh, important officers in the army, the new model army, were dismissed by Cromwell, who were t was terrified of their influence with the soldiers and the, the, the level as influence still remained. Republican influence anyway, it was very strong indeed among the soldiers. Saxby, who you'll remember from the, uh, from the uh, Putney debates, wrote together with another, I think it was Wildman, wrote with another ex leveler a pamphlet entitled, the title tells it all, Killing No Murder, in which he quoted the Bible and classical authors to justify the idea that the homicide of a tyrant was lawful. And he argued that Cromwell was a tyrant who deserved death as much as Caligula or Nero, if not more so. In fact, so great, so great was Saxby's hatred of Cromwell that he actually attempted to form an alliance with royalists, with the counter-revolution in order to assassinate him, but didn't succeed, the plot failed. Saxby was imprisoned in the Tower of London and uh, he died of a fever before being brought to trial, I think it was in 1658. But in the end, of course, despite all Cromwell's efforts to avoid assassination, he wasn't assassinated, but... Uh, Naturally, death comes to all of us, and uh, it came to him by natural causes. He was he suffered from some illness. I'm not quite sure what it was. It Maybe cancer. The record is not, not quite clear on the subject. But in September 1658, same year that Shakespeare died, actually, Cromwell passed away at the age of uh, 59. And here was a problem. Here was a problem. It wasn't uh, actually a monarchy, but nevertheless, what? Who's to take his place? He, he died he in a coma, who fell into a coma before he died, he didn't leave instructions. So there was panic among the generals, so who's to take his place? There was a half-hearted attempt to put his son, his eldest son, Richard Cromwell, uh, in his place as Lord Protector. The problem was that Richard Cromwell, apart from uh, probably a very nice chap, personally, a decent sort of fellow, absolutely no interest in politics. And I've often noticed that um, I've seen myself that, uh, you know, the, the, the political genius is not uh, hereditary, it's not transferable in, your, in the disease. I've seen this many times. See that in, in Marx's uh, horrible son. His daughters, daughters were okay, but his grandson, rather, I beg your pardon, is a right-wing right socialist, I believe, in France. And Richard was, was a decent sort, but he had absolutely no, no interest, no ambition, no interest in this. And the, as soon as he was able to, he abdicated. He, he came under pressure to abdicate, to, to abdicate, and he was very content so to do. But the, you see, there were objective forces at play here. The mood in Parliament was now swinging sharply to the right. And this is a class question. Parliament was dominated by the men of property, as I've said. They, they, they were in the saddle, they didn't enrich themselves, they were quite happy as long as the money was coming in. And they now were terrified, of course, you know, the, the, the power, there was a power vacuum. And they were, they were terrified that the revolution, which had not yet run its uh, entire course, would again flare up and represent a, tr a threat to their material interests, to, the, to their property. 
And therefore, they were, they were terrified of a, period, of a revival of the revolution of the civil war, even revolutionary upheavals, which they considered as a deadly, immortal threat. And this pushed them in the direction of, of restoration, actually. The monarchy, they, they increasingly saw the monarchy as a bulwark, a necessary bulwark against the revolution in defense of their property. The city of London, for example, became a nest of, uh, of Republicans, of, not Republicans, the opposite of monarchist conspirators. They even su they succeeded in winning over the city militia. That was obviously a, a deliberate threat. But that wasn't really where the power uh, lies. The, the, power, the power, as I explained, was in the hands of the, the, the army, the tops of the army, the grandees. Now, an army in any country is always uh, a mirror that faithfully reflects the different trends and tendencies in society. The tops of the army, there were some of the officers that were corrupt, that were at least beginning to have doubts about uh, the, uh, the cause they were taking. Although none of them were, not, not one of them was, would dare to express these doubts openly. You know, they, they had to keep quiet. They uh, still protested that they believed in the good old cause Hadn't they fought against the king? Didn't they have credentials as imp impeccable pl pl uh, credentials as Cromwellians and so on? Yes, but they would whisper in corners. Yes, but times have changed now and we must change with the times and so on. A little bit like what happened in the Soviet Union uh, 25, is it, 25 years ago, before the collapse of the Soviet Union, the same kind of thing. They all still had their Communist Party cards in their pockets and they didn't believe a word in it, of course. And they were scheming how to get out of this and how to defend their ill-gotten gains, of course. By the summer of 1659, uh, Richard Cromwell had already resigned and that uh, opened up a new game altogether. Now, Charles actually attempted at this. Charles II attempted, even with, all the time they were conspired, a little bit childish, actually, stupid. They tried to organize an insurrection, which failed miserably. This, put down by uh, General Lambert, actually. We'll hear, hear more about him shortly, General John Lambert. But uh, this insurrection failed miserably, and Charles eventually came round to the opinion, he had reason to believe, that the only hope was to win over a section of the generals, which now he attempted to do with some success. And the candidate for counter-revolution was a man called General George Monk, who was a prominent uh, general in Cromwell's army. He was in charge of Scotland, actually, at this time, based in Scotland. He was secretly approached by royalist agents who appealed to his, uh, his vanity, his ambitions, his patriotism. They appealed to all kinds of things. But the fact of the matter was that he didn't need much persuading. And here was a man that the royalists soon grasped. Here was a man uh, who, uh, who would play, play ball with them. Here was a man who fate had reserved for the restoration of the monarchy. Now, but the problem that Monk faced, as he, he realized, he wasn't stupid. He was like, by the way, the biggest scoundrel, I think, in English history, the most, the most disgraceful swine, <laughs> the most unprincipled bastard that, that you could possibly think of. But anyway, he wasn't, he was smart enough. And he now faced a delicate, delicate task of winning over the new model army. But there was a problem, of course. As I've said, Republican sentiment was very strong in the, in the right ranks of the army. And this, this soon found an expression. Uh, the Republican layers, including some levelers, by the way, began to raise their heads again, realized the threat, and they realized what Monk was, uh, was about despite this, all the care he took to conceal his intentions. They decided to act first. And therefore, on the 13th of October, 1659, General John Lambert, the same man that had defeated the Royalists, a man with a long record of uh, heroism in the Civil War, he was close to Cromwell as much for a long time, but then he broke with Cromwell because he was not happy about uh, one-man rule and the, the, the danger of the monarchy. He was a Republican in that sense. He might probably undoubtedly had his own personal ambitions. That's another matter about which one can speculate. But he 
stood at the head of an army of soldiers and he turned up in London in the streets uh, which led to Westminster Hall and the troops physically pre prevented the MPs from entering Parliament, recognizing that Parliament itself, now the Presbyterian gang in Parliament, the, the fat cats, the bourgeois, we can call them by the, that name now, were in fact uh, actively plotting with Monk to restore the monarchy. And of course they succeeded, it wasn't difficult, the same method, they locked the doors, the, the speaker was not allowed to come in, he was sent home in his carriage, and, other MPs were also physically excluded. And therefore, the army officers once again had power in their hands. They must have been very pleased with themselves, but their sense of triumph, unfortunately, was not to last for long. In February 1660, General George Monk marched south from Coldstream in Scotland. The Coldstream Guards is named after that place, actually. Uh, it was near the, near the, near the frontier and uh, began to move in the direction of London with his army. Now, the myth has been assiduously uh, manufactured that, and it's endlessly repeated that uh, the restoration of Charles II was as a result of universal popular acclaim. Well, not so, not so. It is, uh, it is frequently stated that General Monk, as he moved south, he was met with a claim by the population. That may well be true. No, that's not true, actually. What is actually stated, as far as I can see in the record, he was greeted enthusiastically by the, lo the higher local gentry. That, I believe, the local fat cats came out to, to, to cheer him, of course, with their ladies and their children and so on and so forth. But there's one thing that's interesting, and this is never said. I'll say it now. George Monk, General Monk, never mentioned once in all his declarations and so on that he was standing, he stood for the, the uh, restoration of the monarchy. He never mentioned it. And I'll tell you what, if he had have mentioned it, if he said made his, his intentions clear to the soldiers, this rebellion would have been over before it started. He'd have been out. He never said that. The, the only proposal he put forward, the only demand that he put forward, is for a free and full parliament. He said that the parliament in London had been uh, sequestrated, had been uh, kidnapped or uh, intimidated, if you like, by these uh, mutinous troops. And he was going to London to free the parliament. That's all. End of story. He never mentioned the question of that. He kept his mouth shut. Very sly individual. By the way, part of the reason was he wasn't sure how he was going to end up. His forces were not militarily stronger. I think they were weaker than Lambert, particularly in cavalry if I remember correctly, and he wasn't sure he was going to succeed. So he was keeping his, he was a sly individual. He, he played his cards close to his chest. He wasn't going to let on. He didn't let on. He didn't let on what his intention was. Not, till the ele not, not until the 11th hour, but, but one minute to midnight before he finally came out and explained what he was really about. You know? um, but his advance, of course, it had a profound effect on Lambert's troops who were not keen on uh, to put it mildly, not keen on fighting against their comrades. They made this clear. They clear. Lambert attempted to, uh, to halt Monk's advance, but he found himself without an army. The army broke in his hands. He was left without, without, without an army. And therefore Monk eventually entered London and took up his quarters in Westminster without any opposition. Now the question arises, how did the masses respond to this? And how did the soldiers respond to this? Well, the masses, I, I believe, observed these events with a mixture of indifference, apathy, and cynicism. It was as if they, as if they were looking at something that didn't affect them, something in another world, another galaxy. Nothing to do with the everyday, everyday struggle. Men, men and women were struggling to exist, struggling to find a loaf of bread to put on the table. The daily struggle for existence was occupying their intention. Revolution, you see, this is the point, and this is applicable to, to all revolutions, to the French Revolution, to the Russian Revolution, above all. Revolution is a power, powerful devourer of human uh, strength and energy and nervous energy. You know, and here, seven years, imagine it, seven years of constant struggles, uh, battles, killing, death, chaos, upheavals. And at the end of it, what? 
all the, the, the dreams and the ideas are, are shattered. And therefore, there was, must have been a profound sense of demoralization, of dis disappointment, of sadness. Of, above all, a sense of exhaustion, of absolute exhaustion, which, of course, can produce a mood of general apathy and a withdrawal from the struggle. You see this, by the way, in any strike. <clears throat> you know, a strike is like a revolution in miniature. At the beginning of a strike, the workers are active, they're enthusiastic, they attend the mass meetings and the pick pickets and so on. But if the strike drags on for too long without achieving its objective, then the, the thing changes. Beginning with the weaker layers, the more backward layers, they begin to fall into inactivity, they stop attending the meetings, they stop voting, they stop picketing and so on. And eventually the strike collapses. Well, something is it's, it's similar here, except that, of course, uh, a, a revolution is on a far higher level. That's a strike on a far more massive level, in which the masses are, are, are propelled into action, struggling and prepared to, to give their lives a struggle, uh, motivated by a powerful urge to change the existing order. But if, the, if these hopes are not fulfilled, then that, that process can turn into the opposite, can turn, uh, as in this case, I'm sure, with a mood of apathy and uh, disappointment. Uh, Lambert, of course, was defeated. He was deserted by his troops. But he was imprisoned in the tower. He escaped from this. What a brave individual, it has to be said. He escaped from the tower. He tried to stir things up. He tried to appeal to the, the soldiers, to, in effect, to launch a war against Monk, to, to fight for the Republic and so on and so forth. But his words fell on deaf ears. Yes. It would similar, if you like, to Robespierre, if you look at that. When Robespierre tried to appeal to the uh, sans-culotte of the masses in Paris to, to come to his aid, and they didn't do so. Because he'd crushed the left, because they were disappointed, and because they saw no point in it. And therefore, Lambert failed in his, in his attempt. Because the masses were, were harassed, disappointed, and above all, exhausted by seven long years of convulsions, bloodshed, and disorder, of course, the, uh, the psychologically speaking, the, the rich, the fat calves, the middle class also were desperate for peace, order. That's the word that comes forward now. Order. We want order. We demand order. We've got enough of anarchy and chaos and so on. But even many ordinary men and women, working class, you could say that, men and women, now long to, for, for some repose after seven years of storm and stress. And this was a very powerful, think of it, this was a very powerful psychological basis for the victory of counter-revolution. And once the ball started to roll, there was no stopping it. You see, dialectics tells us, does it not, that uh, sooner or later things turn it, can t change into their opposites. That was the case here. That was the case here. To the same degree that, that the revolutionary spirit of the masses had cooled off, and even died out altogether. So the confidence of the counter-revolutionary elements, the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie, grew ever greater. They became more confident, more audacious, more insolent, and more open. Only yesterday, the parliamentarians felt uh, useless, crushed, humiliated by Lambert. But now today, what could they not do? What miracles could not be accomplished? On the other hand, the radical Puritans, the radical wing of, of Parliament, were suddenly thrown into a state of confusion and disorientation. I think that the dizzying speed of events, I mean, it didn't take long for, for, for Monk to enter London without opposition. The dizzying speed of events left them breathless, paralyzed, and incapable of decisive action. So there's a mood, if you like, somewhere between, I imagine, somewhere between astonishment and despair. And they bowed to the inevitable. They just gave it. They just gave it. They didn't. They stopped fighting against it. And now, of course, Monk comes forward openly. The uh, first indication he gives a speech to Parliament, in which he indicates that uh, to them, and they didn't like the sound of that, that he wanted to dissolve Parliament and call new elections in the hope of getting a more right-wing Parliament, which he succeeded in doing. By the way, Cromwell had changed the property qualifications. I think it was brought down to 200 pounds. 
which allow, which gave more weight actually to the more, the more rural districts, I believe, to, at the expense of the towns and cities that were more advanced. And therefore, when the election did finally take place, it was, it was dominated by more counter-revolutionary, conservative uh, elements. The leaders of the Presbyterian Party, they fell over, fell over themselves to, to capitulate to Monk. Uh, you re read their names. Manchester, Fairfax, and many others, they fell over themselves in the haste to, to, uh, to atone for their past sins and, and, uh, and to, to give voice to their royalist, uh, their allegiance to the royalist cause. And therefore, the ground, the ground was, was prepared. But Monk also uh, made it clear in the same speech I forgot to mention. He made it clear that he was not prepared to take the oath. Parliament wanted to pass a, 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 there should be an oath uh, prohibiting the House of Stuart from coming back to England. He said, "I'm not prepared to take this oath." That was a clear indication of which way the wind was, was blowing, and everyone could see this. Everyone could see it. Well, therefore, you see the, 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 the groveling, servile, cowardly nature of the English bourgeoisie. The, the bourgeoisie here, let's call a spade a shovel. The bourgeoisie, far from playing a, a revolutionary role, the bourgeoisie betrayed the English Revolution. Betrayed their own revolution, absolutely. No doubt about it. With a view to, to because of their fear of revolution, precisely. The House of Commons voted... Uh, 500 pounds, it's a lot of money in those days, 500 pounds to buy a jewel for Granville, the earl who, who brought them the king's gracious message, the so-called declaration of Breda, about which I'll deal with in a moment, or Breda. And in this, the, at the same time, they, 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 they moved a vote to present a gift of 50,000 pounds. That's an immense fortune. 50,000 pounds was conferred on the, on, the, on the king, on the exiled king. And ten thousand pounds on the Duke of York, and five thousand pounds on the Duke of Gloucester. So that's that's uh, a lot of money. And the reaction of Charles when when this this loot was offered to him, you can imagine his eyes must have lit up. I think he was a bit hard up in the exile, relatively. His reaction was typically sardonic. He said that uh, it it must surely have been his own fault. That he, that he had not sooner taken possession of the throne, since he found everybody so zealous in, in promoting his happy restoration. Of course, he was being sarcastic. Nevertheless, he accepted the offer. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the declaration of breed that, of course, which the, the parliamentarians were insisting on, included above all that there should be no confiscations and no trial of... Uh, of people for crimes against the king, for crimes committed during the Civil War, with the exception, he had to insist on that, with the exception of the regicides, the people that, that signed the death penalty, the death penalty of his father. Otherwise, they're going to be left off. And there were other concessions. Above all, that he agreed to rule together with Parliament. These are things which Charles I would never accept. But Charles II was not like his father. He was not interested much in principles. He didn't have a single principle in his whole body, I think. But he was interested in the, the money, the jewels, the 50,000 uh, pounds. He didn't care if he was an empty throne with no power. Well, he did care. He was privately complained about it. But in public, he accepted it. He accepted what his father never was prepared to accept. That, uh, in effect, the bourgeoisie would rule, parliament would rule, and he would just be kind of figurehead with limited powers and so on. I mean, he accepted that. And that was sufficient for them to allow him back, which he did. He came back. He came back on uh, May the 1st, 1660. Charles arrived by boat uh, in Dover to take, possession of, to take possession of the vacant throne which so many brave men had died to overthrow. Just imagine it. Imagine how they must have felt. And when he got off his ship, he arrived on, on shore in Dover. He was met, guess by who? By General Monk himself, who he cordially embraced and kissed like a long, lo long lost brother, a long lost friend. Just imagine the kiss of Judas, you know. Why should he not uh, cordially embrace and kiss a man who just made him a present of the English throne? I think it was a fair deal. And of course, uh, 
the traitor monk, this scoundrel, this arrant rogue, this uh, piece of dirt from the gutter, was uh, rewarded for his, well rewarded for his betrayal. Charles raised him up from the gutter to the peerage, naming him Duke of uh, Albemarle, Duke of Albemarle, and made him Captain General of the King's Forces, and I don't know how many other things from this titles he was given. He was very happy with his titles, which made him in, in, in instantly from an upstart to a, to a, a, an aristocrat with, a, with a heraldic lineage and so on. The Act of Indemnity, it was called the Act of Indemnity and Oblivion that was passed, granted pardon to all those who had supported the English Commonwealth and protected it. He had to agree to this because if he didn't, He'd have to arrest and execute them, all those people that were supporting him in Parliament, including General Monk. So that was out of the question. He had to agree with this. But exceptions were made, as I've said. For 104 named individuals who had directly participated in the trial and execution of Charles I, some of them were suffered an agonizing death, a terrible execution, hanged, drawn, and quartered. I think you know what that means that you were hung up by the neck until you're almost dead. Then you're pulled down when you're still alive and you are butchered, literally. You're, in, you're cut open and your entrails are torn out of your stomach and burnt in front of you. And then if you're still alive, may well be, your head is chopped off and you're cut into four pieces. Hang, drawn, and quartered. Yes, so some of them suffer that dreadful f f fate. Unfortunately, uh, 24 of these uh, regicides were already dead. Now, what's to be done about that? You couldn't very well do much about it. So you'd think Robert Charles had other ideas. His revenge pursued them beyond the grave. Cromwell and Henry Ireton, this is his, his uh, son-in-law, and also John Bradshaw was the president of the court, the tried to keep. Their bodies were dug up and their corpses were hanged. Their heads were hacked off their it wasn't easy to cut them off, apparently. The heads were hacked off and stuck on spikes at the end of the West, uh, uh, at the end of Westminster Hall for the edification and amusement of the general public. And that was the end of it. Now, the question must be asked, was Oliver Cromwell a revolutionary? People ask this question. Cromwell, of course, was a very contradictory figure. That is to say, let's be clear about this, uh, he embodies in his person the contradictions that were always implicit in the English Revolution from the beginning to the end. For his royalist enemies, of course, Cromwell was uh, the devil incarnate. He was the embodiment of the revolution and he was the inc incarnation of everything that was evil. That's why, uh, of course, Charles uh, had his body dug up and. Uh, and treated it in the way which I've just described. But among the masses, I think, and particularly among the soldiers, the perception was different. Cromwell, despite everything, enjoyed colossal personal authority because he was a revolutionary. Oh, yes, no doubt about it. And he was seen by many people as the leader of the revolution, which he was. On the other hand, it's true, and this was bitterly resented by the most advanced layer, he, mercil he was also the man who mercilessly crushed the left wing and destroyed the best elements of the revolution. There's no question about that. And he balanced between the classes. This is what he's got in common with, with Bonaparte. That's why it's Bonapartism. He balanced between the classes, but in the end, he always came down in, 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 in defense of private property because, because he was a bourgeois revolutionary, not a, a proletarian revolutionary. There's a quote from Trotsky somewhere, I've got time. If I've got time, I'll quote it, otherwise not. But uh, on the question of the comparison between Cromwell, Napoleon and Stalin, this is interesting. Because there are undoubtedly uh, some similarities between the three, and that's no accident. All three of these figures uh, liquidated a revolution and restored many of the elements of the old regime while preserving, that's the point, while preserving the essential conquests of the revolution. Napoleon and Stalin also, don't forget, were, de were detested by representatives of the old regime 
because in their eyes they appear to be the embodiment of a revolution, the revolution which they both destroyed, paradoxically. And uh, but at the same time, insofar as they maintained the fundamental economic and social gains of the revolution, they they actually were defending the, the revolution. Now, Cromwell is different, actually. Unlike Napoleon and Stalin, who, who did not play a role in the revolution, actually. Napoleon played no role at all in the French Revolution. He attached himself to Robespierre, that's all, at a certain stage, to advance his career, that's all, before proceeding to support the, the Thermidorian reaction. Stalin also played no, no, no real role in, in the Russian Revolution, and his role was as a counter-revolutionary. Cromwell, uh, unlike those two kids, Cromwell actually led the English Revolution. But it was a bourgeois revolution, we have to understand that, which he carried out to the end with the uh, execution of the king, the abolition of the House of Lords, Declaration of the Republic, and so on. Now, of course, uh, there, there's no comparison, let me hasten to add, there can be no comparison between the, the dictatorship of Cromwell and the monstrous totalitarian regime of Stalin, none whatever. And there are se several uh, reasons for this difference, both objective and subjective. Firstly, in the English Revolution, as I've said, the proletariat in the modern sense, the proletariat in the modern sense, hardly existed, except in an embryonic form. The idea of a socialist revolution, if it existed at all, it only did so for a tiny minority and in a very vague and embryonic form. Therefore, when the time came for Cromwell to settle accounts with the, the left wing, it was a relatively easy task. It wasn't so difficult. The task of the balance of forces was not favorable to the left, and the levelers therefore were swiftly crushed without much difficulty. For that reason, it wasn't necessary for Cromwell to resort to extreme violence and brutality against uh, revolutionaries. In the Russian Revolution, things were very different. The Russian workers, Russian revolution was a socialist revolution, and the Russian workers had taken power into their own hands in November 1917. They were conscious of their own power, although they also became exhausted and uh, weakened by years of struggle, that's true. But Stalin, in order to consolidate his uh, totalitarian and bureaucratic regime, he had a far more difficult task. He had to physically liquidate a large number of men and women. I'm talking about hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions at the end of the day, in order to eradicate the democratic and socialist ideas of the October Revolution from the consciousness of the masses. And this bloody work was carried out with great thoroughness. And also, this is an important fact, this is where the subjective factor comes in, by the, the, the extremely sadistic vengeful and spiteful character of Stalin. That played a big role in determining the form of the counter-revolution. And this, uh, this, this is very Joseph Stalin was a cynic, a complete cynic, who never had the slightest interest in principles of any sort, guided entirely by his thirst for personal advancement and also revenge on his enemies. That's a fact. Now, whatever you say about Oliver Cromwell, that, uh, such a description does not fit. Cromwell was a man guided by a firm belief in religious principles, who saw himself as the embodiment of a revolution, which was intended to, to establish the rule of, uh, of the saints on earth. The fact that this fantastic aim was never realized cannot be blamed on, uh, on Cromwell himself, but merely on the conditions that prevailed at the time. The objective conditions, therefore, as I've said, could only result in a bourgeois revolution. Now, should we today recognize uh, Cromwell? Should we celebrate him? Well, I believe that we should. Trotsky also said the same thing. We should pay tribute to Oliver Cromwell as a courageous bourgeois revolutionary who, who, could, who played a very progressive and a democratic task. Which, uh, the, which by the, a task which, by the way, remains to be finished, uh, achieved centuries later. Now, just compare this. This is what I want to underline. Just compare the courageous revolutionary conduct of Oliver Cromwell to the cowardly, spiritless, gutless 
the foremost leaders of the Labour Party. Just, just look at them. Groveling before the monarchy, serving the interests of big business. They patiently wait to take up their seats in the House of Lords, which Cromwell abolished. And as we turn the pages of history, the history books, and compare this lamentable picture, because that's what it is, this lamentable picture of today, with the glory days of the English Revolution, we can honestly we can exclaim, how immeasurably superior were Cromwell and his Ironsides. Now, of course, we must bear in mind that uh, our spiritual ancestors, uh, the ancestors of modern socialism, is not Cromwell, it was whatever, whatever it me, but the level is in diggers, of course. Of course, that is correct. Nevertheless, you know, I, I leave the final words on, on the subject of Cromwell to, to that great Marxist and revolutionary leader, Lev Davidovich Trotsky, in Where is Britain Going? Where he says the following. Cromwell, this is Trotsky speaking, Cromwell was in no sense a pioneer of labor. But in the 17th century drama, the English, the British proletariat, today that is, can find great precedence for revolutionary action. This is equally a national tradition and a thoroughly legitimate one that is wholly in place in the arsenal of the working class. Just remember that. Now, in summing up in my final uh, farewell to you, um, I, I must say that I recently saw a very good documentary about the American Civil War, the American Civil War, the second American Revolution. And I, I thought that they were, I could see that there were very striking similarities with the English Revolution. Now this was a serious, balanced, and scrupulous account of the American Civil War in striking contrast to that ghastly program that the BBC put on, some of you might have read my review of it, was it uh, two or three years ago, which was a, a complete slander, a slanderous account of the English Revolution, an absolute disgrace, which proves to me one thing, it proves to me that to this very day, the bourgeoisie have not forgiven Oliver Cromwell and the English Revolution. They can't forgive. They're terrified. They are terrified of revolution today. That's why they hurl abuse against uh, revolutions of the past, particularly the English Revolution. But you know, the English Revolution, the English Civil War is not just history. It is an unfinished revolution, my friends, which still continues to this very day. You know, William Faulkner, the American writer, once wrote, <clears throat> history is not what was, but what is. Yes, we're living history now. That is a certain fact. And at the end of this uh, marvelous program about the American Revolution, uh, a, a, a historian, a woman of, of color, Barbara J. Fields, said the following, and the word struck me very powerfully. She said, the Civil War is not over. It is still with us today. If some citizens live in houses, and others live in the streets, then the civil war has still to be fought and can still be lost. Now these words are very true and they apply just as much to Britain as the United States. And I will just finish by saying that uh, the English revolution is therefore an unfinished revolution. And when the workers of Britain move as they inevitably will move to change society, they, must in, they will inscribe upon their banner the democratic task, the revolutionary democratic task, which are necessary in order to clear the road of rubbish, to clear the, clear the road for future progress. They will take a big broom and sweep away the parasitical monarchy and the House of Lords and all the other reactionary rubbish left over from feudalism and thus prepare the way for a new and higher form of democracy, a revolutionary democracy, a workers' democracy, which is the basis for a future socialist society.